I will be talking about uh, the young worst case analysis for root isolation algorithms. So this is joint work with, uh, let me make this work. There it is. So this is joint work with Elias Chigaritas that is over there, uh, and Alper Energur that is uh, now in Texas, I think. Okay, so let's go with the problem. So we have real root isolation. So I will focus on the real case. So we have some integer polynomial and we want to isolate the real roots of this polynomial. So what we mean by isolating the roots, we have some intervals, j1, jk, such that its interval has rational endpoints. Then uh, we want that the real zeros are containing the union of the intervals. And finally, we want that each interval contains exactly one real root. The input size parameters for the polynomial will be two. One is the degree, no surprise in that, and the other one is the bit size of the coefficients. So this tau is essentially the maximum bit size of the coefficients of the polynomials. And the complexity measure that we'll have is the bit complexity. So we will care about the number of bit operations that we do. Okay. So the state of the art. So we have the Sturm solver, which use the Sturm count, and this will be d to the four, uh, tau to the square. Here, uh, this tilde in the, in the Landau notation means we are ignoring logarithmic factors. So there is a lot of logarithmic there, but we ignore them. Then we have the car solver, uh, that the worst case bound is still uh, of the same order. Then uh, Sakralov and Merholm develop a mixture between Descartes and Newton's method, and then they obtain d cubed plus d squared tau. But the champion is still a pan's algorithm, which is d squared tau. But now the question is, uh, what's the complexity that we want? So, and if we can beat the champion. So what we do is, so the thing that we wish is essentially d tau. So this will be the let's say the most amazing complexity bound that we can get. Probably we will never uh, live to see this, but okay. Why we care about this? Because this means that we can compute the real roots as fast as we can read the integer polynomial. So as fast as you can read, you can compute the roots. Okay, so now we go here with uh, our friend uh, Descartes, probably known to everyone in the audience, and let's talk about his rule of science. Okay, so you take a polynomial and then you just look at the coefficients of the polynomial, F0, F1, et cetera, and then you count how many times the sign changes. So here I ignore in the zero coefficients and I count in uh, whenever it was plus, mi goes to minus, whenever it goes to minus, go to plus, and there might be sequences of zeros in between. This I use omitted and, and this, for example, minus zero, minus zero, minus zero, doesn't have any sign variation. Okay, so what Descartes uh, wrote after writing, uh, you know, the, uh, what was this course of the method, he wrote this appendix to it that was geometry, and there he has this observation that the number of uh, positive real roots of, us, of a polynomial is less or equal than the number of variation signs. Now here the most uh, uh, an important case is that if the number of variation signs is less or equal than one, we have equality. Of course, uh, we are interested in counting roots in an arbitrary interval, so these positive uh, roots is not important for us. So then one just does this modification. This thing over here is just, uh, I'm just reparametricizing the thing, so I'm just sending the zero infinity interval to the AB interval, and then I'm saying, okay, positive roots of these polynomials are just the roots of the original polynomial that are in the interval that I'm interested in. So now I have something that overcounts. So now the question is, uh, what will Descartes say when I ask him to count uh, roots in a given interval? Okay, the first thing is, he will be always overcounting the roots. If his count is less or equal than one, then I know that the count is exact. Then there is another exactness property, which is if I look at the number of roots that are around my interval in the complex plane, uh, let's ignore constants, etc., and I know that this is less or equal than k, 
then I know that the card will not give me a count that is bigger than k. So that's good. Then uh, this can be translated in Overskov theorem, which uh, essentially is uh, the car is the complex roots around, and if we want to make it a joke, uh, the car gets distracted about the real things because of the complex things around. Okay. So finally, and this is the most important property for why we can use an algorithm with this oracle, is the subadity. So this means I take my interval, I divide it in in several, I divide it in several intervals, and then the sum of the count in each one of the intervals will give me exactly, uh, will be at most the original count. So in a certain way, this subadity guarantees that the total count of signs across when I'm dividing and dividing the interval will not be increasing, will just go down. So the number of intervals I'm considering will not be increasing enormously. Okay, the algorithm here is now uh, quite easy. We start with a subdivision. Usually this contains the initial interval. Then on it, I take some interval in this subdivision. I remove it from this. If the variation is zero, okay, I pass to the next interval. If the variation is bigger than one, I divide this interval in two. There might be a point in the middle, so I just check if this point is a zero. If it is a zero, I add it to my list of isolating intervals. If not, okay, I just ignore it. And finally, if the variation is one, I just add the interval to the corresponding list of isolating intervals. At some moment, I will continue, continue, continue. At some moment, this thing will, uh, this S will become empty. And when this S is empty, I use output set, and I have the solution that is this isolating intervals that I wanted in the first place. So essentially, the measure of the car solvers is subdivide until the variation of signs in each one of your intervals is one or zero. That's it. OK. Here, maybe a small comment is we have a Descartes tree. That the idea is you start with the initial interval. It's time that you subdivide. You write the thing that you subdivide. Then the nodes are the intervals that appear in the computation of the algorithm. So this means, OK, we have subdivide again. Then in some of them, we have a stop. Then we subdivide again, and then we subdivide again. So we can visualize in this way the, the algorithm in your face. And the important thing is that the size of this tree will be the runtime of the algorithm. So if I'm able to control this, I'm able to control the runtime of the algorithm. OK. So now we pass, and let's go focus a little bit on the topic. So are we being pessimistic? So the, in the usual worst case complexity, what we will do in is, OK, we take the maximum of the cost of our solver for a given polynomial where we bound the bit size by tau, and we bound the degree of the polynomial by d. So we prepare ourselves for the worst possible situation that might happen to this solver. And this is the cost, the worst possible cost. OK, now the issue with this is that this is pessimistic. Why? Because many times I, not a, I don't want to solve just one polynomial, but I want to solve a lot of polynomials. So when I solve a lot of polynomials, I'm not interested in the worst possible cost, but I'm more interested in on averaging, adding up all the cost. So then there might be a lot of polynomials that are cheap, and then maybe some few that are expensive. So this is the one that, uh, this is the later case that usually we are more interested. And then also, when we observe the Descartes solver, without doing any modifications, so without adding these modifications by Melchor and Sagralov using Newton's method, etc., one observes that usually the car solver tends to go to works well in practice. So then also the question is, can we explain this behavior of the algorithm? Okay, so in order to go a little bit beyond the pessimism, so we don't want to cut the worst possible cost, one does this thing of averaging out. So this follows ideas of Goldstein and von Neumann when they analyze uh, numerical algorithms for matrices. And then this was retaken again by Demel and Smale when they went into numerical linear algebra and numerical algebra geometry. And more recently, there is this book by Rue Garden, Beyond Worst Case Complexity, which uh, 
uh, yeah, which was uh, which uh, includes also this kind of tricks. So now, okay, we just go to probabilistic complexity. So instead of having a maximum, we have an expectation, and here we should notice this is small exponent l, because the more exponents we can control, the best our probabilistic estimates they are. Because this means that if we can control this expectation in a finite weight for a lot of exponents, this means that the probabilistic behavior will be more uniform. Okay. So the main issue with this model is, okay, what's a good random polynomial? I mean, this is essentially the Achilles, this is the Achilles part where one can attack this. What does means this to be good? Because the issue of this is that there are many choices for randomness. And when you have a lot of choices for randomness, okay, why your choice is good or why your choice is justified. And of course, the justification of the choice cannot be because for this choice of randomness, my algorithm is fast. Because here we are in a discrete setting, so I could choose a polynomial with probability one, and this will be a random choice, technically. Okay, so let's go to what we can call the first version of the theorem. So this is like the easier to understand version. So here we take a polynomial. Okay, I write it in the usual way. And then I take the coefficients to be independent. So I choose the most obvious choice that one does. Okay, I want my coefficients to be integers, so I choose my coefficients in the interval minus two to the tau to two to the tau, an integer. So this is the same as choosing an integer of size at most tau randomly, and I choose my coefficients in a way that they are independent. So this in a certain way is a sort of uniform random bit polynomial. Let's call it like this. And in this particular case, uh, what we obtain in the paper is that, okay, if you take the expectation of this Descartes solver with respect to this random polynomial, we will have a bound that is d squared plus d tau. Okay, we have this d squared factor, uh, summand, but okay. In terms uh, when the bit size of the coefficients is comparable to the degree, this gives us the desired uh, complexity. So in other words, what we are saying is that on average, the card uh, is almost optimal. So this is a justification of this. And now, of course, uh, you can be okay, but if what if you don't choose exactly the coefficients in this way? Because okay, maybe instead of choosing my, I don't want to choose my coefficients exactly in this interval, or maybe I want just to choose the even coefficients or odd coefficients or coefficients with some special property because of whatever reason. So then what we do is, okay, we consider more general random models. So in this case, okay, we have our polynomial. Again, we will assume that the coefficients are independent. This makes our life easier. And then we consider several measures. One of them is the bit size of the coefficients. Okay, this is used tau f. It's the maximum possible bit size that my coefficients can get. This is a complicated way of writing this. And then we have the weight. So the weight is in a certain way the maximum probability that a value that my coefficients can take a value. If this weight is big, is near to one, it means that I am very near a deterministic case because there is some coefficient that is taking one value with very high probability. So then it's not so much random, it looks more like a deterministic guy where maybe sometimes I choose something else. And here it's important to look at this condition is that there is no typo, there is not three dots missing. We only need to bound the weight of the first two coefficients and of the last two coefficients. This was something we discovered during the proof. Okay, so once we have defined these two, we introduce what we call the uniformity of F, which is this kind of complicated measure, okay, the logarithm of some quantity. And the important thing, okay, why we care about this quantity, uh, is because this quantity is what the one that will appear in the theorem. So now we have the same as before, but now we have one, one plus uf. So now the question is, okay, what is this uf in general? So for the cases that we can look, what is this? So important thing is that if f is uniform, then this uf is zero. So this uf is like kind of a measure of how much our polynomial differs from being the uniform random polynomial. But then an important thing is that in many cases, this uniformity parameter of the random polynomial will be a constant. 
So you can forget about it. So in a certain way, we get a nice bound. So then we can, in the case that tau is comparable to d, then you can say that this is almost like reading, solving is almost like reading, so then that Descartes is almost optimal on average. And in order to illustrate this with a more, let's say, less abstract cases, let's show how we can use our model in order to produce example of random polynomials. So for example, we can control the support as long as our support contains our four special parts of the support, so 0, 1, d minus 1, and d. Uh, we can uh, apply the, the theorem goes through, and then we have that the support essentially, and that the uniformity parameter will be zero. So then it applies to this class of polynomials. Then we can also control the sign, so we can choose the signs that we want, and we can force our polynomial to have the signs that we want, the coefficients. So we can force coefficients to be positive, and we can force coefficients to be negative. And in this case, the uniformity parameter will be logarithm of three, which is al almost a constant. Similarly, <laughs> we have the exact bit size, and okay, we can use prescribe an exact bit size for the coefficients. Nothing more, and again, we get logarithm of three, and again, this is like O1. Okay. And then you can do a lot of combinations of this. So I can prescribe signs, I can prescribe support, and can maybe choose on even numbers. So there is a lot of way of combining these choices that I'm putting here. Okay, so the important thing of this is that our random model is flexible. And now I'm a small comment, because otherwise uh, Alperen might uh, get angry at me, is that we have this mooted case, case included in our model. So this means if I get a random bit polynomial, I get a fixed polynomial of a certain bit size. I get my sigma for the size of the noise, whatever means this in the bit case. Then I can consider the same smoothed game as usual. And then this will be a random bit polynomial. I can still bound the uniformity. So in a certain way, I, our model includes perturbation of fixed polynomials by a random polynomial of a certain magnitude. So this is good. Okay, so what goes into our analysis? So I will uh, discuss briefly the three ingredients that goes into the analysis. On the one hand, we have condition numbers. Okay, we have this quantity, this numerator, this denominator with this maximum over the full uh, interval minus one, one. Okay, this looks like a complicated expression. Important thing of this quantity is infinity if and only if our polynomial has a double root in the interval minus one, one. That's it. Because why we use this quantity? Because upper bounds on the condition number implies lower bounds for root separation, and lower bounds for root separation implies upper bounds for the depth of the Descartes tree. So the tree, in this way, we bound the depth of the tree. Then we have the other thing that we bound is number of complex roots. Because upper bounds for the number of complex roots, root, uh, yeah, here it's important to care that we care about nearby roots, so we don't bound the complex roots in the whole complex plane because this will be useless. The bound always will be D. But we bound the, the complex roots that are around the interval that we work and around the other interval that we work. This means upper bounds for the width of the Descartes tree. So if there are a few complex routes around, this means that the width of the Descartes tree will not grow a lot. If the width of the Descartes tree doesn't grow a lot, we are good. So we are bounding the depth, we are bounding the width. So with this, we bound the size of the, com of the Descartes tree, and with this, we bound the complexity of Descartes. How we do this? Okay, we do some complex analysis. Where complex analysis doesn't mean that the analysis is complex, but that they use analysis over the complex numbers. And uh, there, the key word will be this Tigmar's theorem. Not uh, important, now this detail. And finally, the last part is that we have Ball's smoothing theorem. So if we have a discrete random variable, and we get a continuous uh, random one, and we consider the sum, then this will be a continuous random variable. And in this way, what we can guarantee is that we can use our old continuous toolbox. So this is time over. 
pa, pa, pa. Okay. So yeah. So in this case, we can use our all continuous toolbox to actually finish the to do the to transfer our continuous results to the discrete case that we are analyzing. So this is the important thing we are using it here. Okay. So of course. There is a lot of details that I'm leaving outside, but this is not important. So summing up, so the card solver is almost optimal on average, and uh, scary casco uh, for your attention. Are there some questions? So thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question. So at the end, you mentioned something about uh, reducing to continuous uh, probability. So, but uh, your um, U of F, was it defined also for continuous uh, distribution or only discrete distribution? Only discrete distribution. I mean, this uh, UF was a polynomial with integer uh, coefficients, so. The distribution was discrete. So, what about continuous, fully continuous distribution like Gaussian uh, distribution for the? I mean, uh, then it's a lot easier because you don't have to do this. And this is in the what was in the paper of two years ago uh, with uh, Chigaridas. That was uh, condition numbers for the for the cube one hypersurfaces. So there we discuss it. And then whatever we apply here to the discrete case, it can be applied to the continuous case under sub-Gaussian assumption and uh, anti-concentration inequalities assumption. Ooh, are there other questions? Three, two, one. Thank you.